take around about 10 minutes to read. Um, and uh, some of them are very thought-provoking and very practical, I must say, this, this time. Uh, I had to read them a couple of times to uh, uh, experience just how valuable they were, but they have a great deal of value, so I do encourage you to look at them. And we will be looking at some of them in brief this morning as we consider our topic. So now with all of that, I think we're ready to go. So let's uh, begin by bowing our heads, shall we, and asking that the Heavenly Father, by His Holy Spirit, will bless our meditation in this kingdom. Father in heaven, our God, and our Lord, we've, sat, we've, we've come here this morning because we want to learn, Heavenly Father. We are like creatures, creatures of the moment. We need to know how to, to, to reach that eternal shore that you've assured us is there for us. So we pray, loving Lord, that you truly will help us this morning to hear your word for us and to apply it to our, our, our actual experience. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Last week, at this time, some of us were at the uh, Pathfinder Expedition. Uh, there's quite a number of us here actually who were there, Ethan and uh, Jonathan and Andre and Imogene, Sabine, Jason, Nathan. We were all there, weren't we, at this very time and we were meeting outside in a lovely uh, paddock area where we worship. And then after the worship and after lunch on Sabbath, we broke up into smaller groups, groups of about six or eight, with our backpacks on our back, and we launched out into Maramara National Park. We were told that all through the hills, the forests, the, the, uh, the, the valleys and the mountains of the National Park, there were markers that were hidden. They were clearly marked on the map. We could see them on the map, but we needed to find them in reality. And so each uh, party, one of ours was led by Barton, that I was part of with my grandson Jaden, uh, launched out with a particular series of markers in mind. We were taught how to use a compass. And I have here the, the map that we were given and the compass that I used for the first time, and you may be able to see the little red dots that marked all the markers there. It was quite an experience. Uh, in our group, we allocated different people at different occasions to lead, uh, lead the, the six of us through the bush. And it was very thick bush. I haven't been in bush in, in uh, Sydney as thick as this bush. It was so thick that you had to part the, the, the undergrowth all the way to get through. And so the first person would do that and the rest of us follow, would follow along. At one stage in the afternoon we designated Imogene to be our fearless leader. She took her compass with her, she got the bearing as Barton told us to do and she headed off in that particular direction. No pathway through the bush at all. She just followed the compass and the rest of us followed. I think it was for Imogene to fairly stressful occasion because she knew that everybody was just following her and that if she went the wrong way we'd all be going on the wrong way as well. Eventually we came, I remember, to a particular part of the, of the forest. We hadn't found the marker and uh, some of our team, and I won't mention who they were, said that's enough, we're not going any further. And uh, it was just a, uh, a rock shelf on the side of the, uh, the, the top of the mountain and so they began to uh, put up their tents. We didn't, won't mention any names. <laughs> so that's where we camped for the night. But that didn't quite satisfy our fearless leader, Barton. From previous experience, he knew that doing this kind of bush bashing at night was even a more exciting experience. Now, I've never done that before. Some of the others I think had, but most of the others were quite intimidated. And so when Barton said, who would like to, to, to uh, 
uh, bush bash in the, uh, at night and see if we could find this marker. I put my hand up and my grandson put my, his hand up. And uh, the three of us plunged into the depths of the bush at night in the dark with only a compass and a map. Now, I'm usually fairly good in the bush. I spent my life wandering around the, uh, the bushlands of, of, of the north of Sydney and I know my way around very well. Never been lost in my life. I know basically that you know if you're going in this direction, that's the direction you need to go, even though you may get a little lost along the way. On this occasion, however, while it, when it was pitch black, we had nothing but a compass, we got lost. At least I thought we were lost. I was so sure we were lost that I gathered our little group, my grandson and Barton and myself, and we said, we need to go. We're lost. I didn't like the thought of spending the night in the bush with nowhere to sleep. So we prayed. And then I said to Barton, I said, look, I think you need to phone headquarters and tell them that you're lost. And so Barton got on the, uh, the uh, walkie-talkie phone and he, he phoned headquarters and he said, we're between this marker and this marker and I think we're lost at the moment. And I said, well, that's nice. Have a nice night, sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> we were lost and I was scared. And we continued to try to figure out from the compass and, and the map exactly where we were. And the more we did it, the more we went around in, in circles. And, and finally, finally Barton said, would you like me to have a go? Within, fifth, within five minutes, we were back at the camp. We had been no further than 50 metres from the camp. <laughs> I didn't know where we were. I was used to trusting my instincts and my feelings rather than what the compass said. And I was lost. I wonder if you'd like to turn in the Bible with me today. Passage in the Bible which says that very thing. It's found in 2 Peter. Chapter 1. Second Peter, chapter 1. In verse 19 says this. Second Peter, chapter 1, and verse 19 says. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And here the Apostle Peter is likening the prophetic word, the Bible, to a light that shines in a dark place. And I think you would all agree with me, would you not? That human experience is often a very dark place. I think uh, as we read the newspapers and listen to the television commentaries, there is a growing body of political commentators who are saying that we are moving into a very dark place, politically and, uh, and internationally. You know. And all of us know in our own lives periods of darkness, don't we? Where we just don't know what to do. Some of us have experienced real periods of soul darkness. Where, there are, where our depression is so thick our grief so real, our despair so deep, that we just don't know what to do. And here, the Apostle Peter is saying that we should take heed to the Bible as a light that shines in a dark place. We are to trust this Bible 
when we cannot follow our instincts. And just as I needed to learn, and still I have to say need to learn, I'm not sure even now, Barton, that I could trust the compass as you do. I need, we need to learn to trust the Word rather than our instincts when it comes to living our lives at this, at this stage in history. And I want to say to you first of all then, that if we are to trust this Bible as the compass for our lives, we need to be really clear as to exactly what this Bible is. What, what exactly is it to us if it's to be a compass in our lives? It used to be that uh, this Bible was an exceedingly precious book. Our uh, reading Pastor Elder Wilson talks about the, um, the preciousness in the, in the first reading of the, uh, the Bible in past times. He talks about John Wycliffe, who gave his life to translate the Scriptures, just so people would have this light in their own lives. And William Tyndale, who spent his life and gave his life so that people could have a Bible they could understand in their own lives. And then he asks the question, how is it that in times past people could so value the Bible that they would be willing to give their lives for it? Why was it so precious to them? What did they believe it was? Don and Christy at prayer meeting shared with us an experience that they had while they were away on holidays in Fiji. They were holidaying there and got to know a couple quite well with whom they share quite a bit in common. They laughed and they talked and they shared stories and they just had, they were, you know, they were kind of a compatible couple until at one stage one of them noticed that maybe this couple, Christy and Don, were Christians. So not Christians, are they, is it? Yeah. And that suddenly changed the conversation. Suddenly, from warmth and friendship and, and gregariousness, there was defensiveness and even scorn and anger that people could actually believe that there was a personal God. We have changed, my dear friend from a society that values this book so much that people were willing to give their lives to it, to a society where people are not exactly angry with the book, they at least treat it with benign neglect. Today, the Bible has been muted as to its actual power and effect. basically says to her and to the class that this book is a book of inspiring writings. Great thinking about God and his and, and, uh, and, and spiritual truth, but not authoritative truth. It's interesting because it, it tells us what they thought back there about God, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that that's what's true about God. And so in talking about the God, uh, about the Bible as a collection of great spiritual writings in the past, which give, have life, but don't have absolute life, they are neutering the power of the Bible. My daughter can't use this Bible now as the voice of God for his soul. She just says, well, isn't that interesting that that's what they thought about God? Other people say, this book is a wonderful book. 
It's a great collection of inspiring literature. Abraham Michel, the great uh, Jewish theologian, said, I wonder what Moses and Jeremiah would say if their writings were just considered great literature. They probably would say what Einstein would say if his manuscript, which contained the theory of relativity, were acclaimed for its beautiful handwriting. Missing the point. Missing the power. And so I want us to be really clear in our minds this morning, personally, what is this book to you? I want, us to, I want the scriptures to say what they are to us this morning. I want us to look at two verses very quickly, just to remind us, so that we can have a vivid sense, again, of what this Bible is for us. Read with me in 2 second, uh, second, uh, Timothy chapter 3, exactly what the Bible says about itself. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse, uh, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul speaking to, uh, to Timothy says, And from childhood you have known these holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, All scripture, all holy writing, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture, it says, is what is given by inspiration of God. Now, unfortunately, when you and I read those words, the word inspire gives us the wrong opinion, the wrong idea. Sometimes, you know, people will go along and say, I went along to this really inspiring rock concert. I was inspired, they say. And they say, that's what it means. It simply means that God has given us these inspiring writings. But that isn't what it says. It says that all scripture is inspired by God. And the word used in the original language is all scripture is God breathed. Now that may not mean very much to you, but if you turn with me just for a moment to uh, Psalm uh, 33, just to see what the idea of something being God-breathed means. Psalm 33. In verse 6. Psalm 33 and verse 6. It says this, By the word of the Lord the heaven." were made and all the host of them that is of the heavens by the breath of his mouth this is saying that the wonders of the of the Milky Way galaxy are simply the production of God breathing in other words when God breathes he creates something so this is saying, is it not, that these scriptures, being God-breathed, are God-created. That this book is a God-created book. You turn over to the uh, book of uh, Second Peter, which is the other text that we usually like to look at when we are defining exactly what we mean by scripture. 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 1. We get to verse 19 again. So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed of the light that shines in the dark place until the day dawns and the, the uh, morning star arises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private for prophecy, and by prophecy it's meaning the Bible as a whole, 
but for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were, what does it say? Moved by the Holy Spirit. And once again, the word in the English language doesn't convey the vital vividness of the original language. You know, we can be moved by a, by a profound symphony, can we not? Or by reading Shakespeare. But this is something more than simply being emotionally moved. These people, it says, in the original language, were born along. In other words, it's like they hoisted their sails and the sails caught them up and they were born along in a particular direction. They were caught up by it. Something very profound was happening. And so when the scriptures were written, they were written by men who were so overborne by the Holy Spirit that they were moved along in harmony with God's thoughts, in harmony with God's will. So what do we say then about the, the, the nature of this Bible that we hold in our hands? I think we simply agree with the simple words of Ellen White, a prophetic voice, when she said, my brethren, my sisters, take this Bible as it is, as the very voice of God to your soul. And my question to you is, is that how we always reverence this book? The very voice of God to your soul. saying to me, Pastor, I know that that's true, theologically and doctrinally, but I have to tell you that it often doesn't seem like that. Life is pretty tough. I get into a bad space during the week. I can't think straight. I can hardly think what my next thing to do is. And you're trying to tell me that this book, which is just Letters on a page is actually the voice of God to my soul. Sometimes it does just, we open the book and it does just seem like dead bits of ink on white paper. We thirst, we thirst, do we not, in times of real need, for something more than just words or even ideas. We thirst for a living word that speaks deeply to our soul. Do we not long for that? And so there have been movements in the last 100 years or so in the Christian church that have been reactions to a doctrine of Scripture which was all too Bible-based. We want more than simply dry doctrines or words on a page. We want the living spirit speaking lively to us so we know it's God speaking to us. Pentecostalism is like that. A group of people in America, I think it was in Chicago, who got together in an upper room and who prayed, Lord God, send us your spirit so that we know that you're speaking to us. And they earnestly prayed that. And felt that the Holy Spirit fell on them. And that began the great Pentecostal movement, which is sweeping the world today. And people go to Pentecostal churches, abandoned Protestant churches of that, because they long, they say, to actually hear the voice of God. Imagination of the person. 
And by doing these things, you sense deeply in your soul that you're in the presence of the Almighty. There's the one pressure in your own church. Similarly started by a group of well-meaning young ministers in California who got together and said, it isn't simply enough to know the doctrines. We need a vivid presence of God in our lives. And they prayed together earnestly over several days and began to wonder. Is that longing wrong? That longing for more than simply doctrine and theology and drive boys in the parish? I would suggest to you that it's not. I would like to look with them for a moment at two things that Jesus said in John, in the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 5. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. The Lord Jesus said this, John chapter 5, verse 39. Speaking to the Jews, he said, You search the Scriptures. And I think I mentioned to you earlier this year when we went across to Israel and we went to the Wailing Wall and we went in and, and, and looked at the way the Jewish Orthodox people searched the Scriptures. I mean, they searched the Scriptures. There's nobody that searches the scriptures quite like the Jewish Orthodox people. But Jesus said of them, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. That if you just knew the scriptures, you'd have eternal life. What did Jesus say? But they are they which testify of something beyond themselves. Not merely knowledge of the scripture, but a knowing of the one whom the scripture is witnessing to, an experience of him. John chapter 4. Jesus is talking to the woman of the well. That woman who was so hungry for something. Five husbands and she still had a family. Jesus said to her, you are worshipping. I read the Bible in verse 21. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, he said, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's speaking to this very longing which has been manifest in Protestantism, in our own church, for more than just truth. Spirit and truth. Worshipping in the soul. Contacting God in reality, in my experience. Talks about prayer in that regard. 
he talks about prayer as being communion with God. In fact, in the old, and I need to be careful to hear how I say this, but you know in the older versions of Step to Christ, the word communion is not used. It's not communion with God, it's intercourse with God. It's been removed in recent years because of its over-sexualization. But that word essentially means a deep, deep intimacy with another. A hearing back from when I'm saying words. That's what prayer is meant to be. So the question comes to us, how does that happen? When I pray, when I read the Bible, how do I hear back from God? Now, Christian history is replete with inspiring stories of how great Christians turn back from God. You know very well, don't you, the story of John Wesley, the man who longed for something deeper in his experience over in England, and eventually goes along to this Bible study in Aldersgate Street in London, and, and feels, he says, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt something. And it changed me. And Martin Luther, who famously searched and lashed himself and, and yearned and couldn't find, eventually stumbled on something and he said it was as though it was as though heaven itself opened to me. The language, you see, of people experiencing. I dare say, if I was to come and talk to almost any one of you here this morning and say, have there been times like that in your life where God speaking to you was surreal? And it convicted you. You, you. you knew that it was more than just words and words. And so because that is our because that does happen. You have movements such as the Pentecostal movement today that is insisting that we do experience more than simply words and ideas. Andrew Murray is a one of the favourite writers of the charismatic movement. He's a man who realized that uh, Protestantism had, was becoming very arid, simply doctrines and ideas. And he began to talk about real prayer, where God gave real answers to real requests. He talks in this book, which, by the way, if I might indulge myself just a moment, in this little book that I have here, I learn is, uh, it was given first of all to somebody in, in 1909, that's what, 110 years ago? Yep. An old book. Probably the term of truth, you listen to this. Andrew Murray says one of the great difficulties, one of the greatest difficulties with young believers is to know how they can find out whether what they desire is according to God's will. Now you hear that? You hear that? Isn't that true? Don't we long to know whether the thing that we are planning or longing to do is in fact in, in accordance with God's will? We, we, we long for that. You know, you hear about the, about the, uh, the person who says, and, and let me just, I'll just quote this from, from this, this uh, reading. This is Tuesday's reading, and this is by Karen Holman. She talks about some of the situations where we long to hear God's will for it in specific ways. She says here at the bottom of page 10, um, my wife has been offered a three-year contract to work in another country. She'll be able to come home only twice a year, but it will pay for our children's education. Is that a good idea? Or should we become pioneer missionaries to Bangladesh? Or someone else says, I'm in love with this amazing man. I know if God wants us to get married. I mean, these are real situations.
situations where there is no specific answer in the book, is there? You can't look up in the book and say, well, it says, thou shalt marry Jason. You know, you can't do that. So how do you know? Coming back to, to Mueller again, he says, uh, one of his greatest privileges with young believers is to know how they can find out whether what they desire is according to the will of God. Uh, he goes on to say, that God in fact is willing to make known of concerning things of which his word says nothing directly that they are his, they are his will for us and that we may ask for them. And so he is saying that the Spirit will teach us specifically his will beyond the words of Scripture. And my question to me and to you and to the Bible is, how does he make that known? I was with some friends just recently of another church, a charismatic church just recently. They were facing a difficult situation in their coming marriage. What should we do? Backwards and forwards we talk about. Somebody eventually said, well, maybe you could ask for a sign, you know, of what we should do. And the young man said, well, I'm not sure about signs. I, I'd rather actually know what the principles of the word are, so that then I can see if we can apply them in my own life. You know. The point I'm trying to make is this. How do we know God's will about specific situations? Are we to expect signs? as his preferred way of speaking to us. It would seem that that particular question was a question which had grown in importance in the early Christian church. So that when John comes to write his gospel, the gospel of John, the fourth of the gospels, he is directly one of the issues that he's talking about is how can we know the will of God? How does God speak? And just to be very brief, maybe if you could just turn with me for a moment in to, to John chapter 2. You see the time is rushing away from me and I have lots more I want to say, but there you go. Um, John chapter 2 for a moment. John chapter 2, verse 8. Jews answers and, and, and say to Jesus when Jesus has just done, done a great sign in the temple and cleansing the temple. The Jews answer and say to him, So what sign do you show to us since you were doing these things? And in verse 23 it says, Now when they when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. So, people in that day were really interested in a sign. How can I know? And John is really careful in this gospel to say that it isn't signs, it's the word that you need. And he tells that, and he emphasizes that by this story in John chapter 4, which we looked at last time we had a, a sermon together. John chapter 4, where the nobleman, you remember, comes to Jesus. Please heal my son. Way back down there in, in Capernaum. I'm a, a day's journey away. And, G, and, he, and in, in John chapter 4 and verse uh, 48, Jesus says to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. You're always looking for signs. Something beyond the scriptures. And that was the nobleman said to him, Sir, sir, come down. Come down before my child dies. Jesus says to him, Go your way. Your son lives. And then this. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he believed. There was no moving in his heart. There was no, 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 no miracle to look at. Just the word. And Ellen Wise 
very telling has a sentence here which I think is extremely helpful in this question of how do I know whether God is speaking to me or not? She says, in the Zorro Baptist, page 2, it is not because we see or feel that God hears us, that we are to believe Him. We are to trust in His promises, in His word. Do you understand the implications of that? It is not because we see or feel that we are to believe. We are not to expect uh, an in when it says here see, what does it mean see? It means inwardly see. You know what I'm saying? Sort of a sense, I, I think I see this in my imagination. Or feel. Yeah, you know, I have this conviction that, that God actually is listening to me this moment. It is not because we see or feel that we are to believe. We are to trust His promises. Now I'm afraid that I have talked so long that I've worn you out. And I, the most important thing I want to say is right now. Can you hand me? The most important thing is this. That when I am seeking God's, seeking to know hear from God. I need to settle in my mind that what I have here is the very voice of God to myself. I need to get into my room alone, on my knees, with my Bible open. And I need to look for a verse that speaks to my situation. And I need to receive those words as the word of God to my soul, as real, as if an angel were there speaking those words in my ears. Verse 21 and 22 and 
Without going into detail, this, is, this man says, this, uh, thus my heart was grieved in my, I was vexed in my mind, I was in a bad space mentally, you know, I really was. In fact, I was so foolish, he says in verse 22, and ignorant, I was just like a brute beast before him. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. Do you see how that scripture can speak to you? You can claim that, can you not? You can say, I, I don't even like you anymore. I'm, I'm confused. I'm, I'm just as unresponsive to you as as a brute beast in the field. What does it say? Nonetheless, I am continuing with you. Here's, a, here's something you see that you can claim for yourself no matter how you feel. And that's what you must do, my friend. You must take that promise and say, that means it's true at this moment for me. Those kinds of 
experiences where God seemed a long way away, she felt pain. She's writing to somebody else who's going through this, right? She says the enemy will, who will? The enemy will. The enemy will. The enemy will tempt you to think that you have done things that separated you, have separated you from God. Then this, and we may know by the feeling we have that comes over us when we pray. Did, did she say that? We may know because the Holy Spirit floods our lives with this sense of the peace and the presence of God. And I, 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 I know that God loves me. This has happened to me. Did she say that? Did she hold that out to this poor person who's struggling with these depressed feelings? What did she say? The enemy will tempt you to think that you've done things that have separated you from God and that he no longer loves you, that our Lord loves us still. And we may know by the words he has placed on record for just such cases as yours. The words he's placed on dear friends, Take the word of God as it reads, as the very voice of God in your soul. 